You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Good evening to everyone out there listening to WCATradio.com. My name is Robert Madrigal, the host of this show, Know Your Faith, a forum for those who know the faith, a source for those who would like to get to know the faith, a.k.a. Unapologetically Apologetics. And on this show, we talk about Catholic apologetics. And we are unapologetic about our love for God, our love for Christ, and our love for the Catholic Church. The topic for tonight's show is Misunderstood Catholic Doctrines. And we are going to talk on a part two of our series on Why Catholics Call Priests Father. Tonight, we dedicate the next hour, to Catholics who would like to understand the faith and Catholic doctrines. For a good apologia and defense of the Church, we need to study Scripture. Tonight, we're going to talk about the tradition of calling priest father, and it's closer to a catechism class than apologetics. We're going to go over the stuff that we as Catholics should keep in mind about this tradition. So before we jump in to tonight's topic, I would like to begin with a prayer. And we'll begin our prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we come to you in great thanksgiving this evening for this opportunity to come together as brothers and sisters in Christ so that we may learn more about our faith for the sake of defending the faith. We ask that you grant us the strength to explain and defend our faith with patience and charity, and to see challenges to our faith as a chance to evangelize and to spread the love and peace of Christ to all whom we meet, and to do this through the example of self-sacrifice that Christ provides for us through his death on the cross. And we ask this in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. So we'll end our prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so why do Catholics call priests father? And that's a very interesting question, because it says in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 23, verse 9, plain and simple, call no man on earth father, for you have only one father, and he is in heaven. Oh my goodness, I've been calling priests father Let's see, there's Father Michael, there's Father Vincent, Father Lorenzo, etc., etc. Man, I'm doomed to have to share a jail cell in hell with Hitler, for, now, for sure now. Imagine that when Hitler, Lenin, Stalin, whoever's there, I don't know, are hanging out in hell. And when they ask us Catholics, what are you in for? We have to explain to them, I called priests father. Okay, well, please excuse my sarcasm, but the first point I have to make is that we Catholics in our 20, excuse me, 2,000 year history (laughs) have always called priest father, and it was never an issue until the Protestant revolt of the 1500s. So, we would be able to add this tradition of calling priest father to a list of items that we would find and we would be able to call signatures on the Catholic Church from the first century. And I call them signatures because they are marks or better better yet signatures that were left on the Catholic Church from the first century. Kind of like the signatures left on America from England and the colonial era. Now just to make my meaning even sir. When I talk about signatures, an example would be that here in America, we speak English, for the most part. And that is a signature that the British left on America from the colonial era. Now, there are many British ideas and ideals that you will see in our everyday lives as well. The way that the British handle commerce, for instance. Additionally, here's my third example, is that the Protestants were the largest 
religious group in England during the colonial era. And you'll find that the English Protestants left their marks, or once again signatures here as well. The National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. is Anglican, or the Church of England. That's a good example. So, this issue or even problem that we have of call no man on earth father has one big glaring hole in it. And that is that it's a good example of a signature left on the Protestant churches and all the churches that came after it as well, after the Protestant movement. All Protestant doctrines that come from that point in history, known as the Reformation era, are signatures on any church that came after it. Now this era left its mark on any church that came after the Protestant movement. This would include Baptist, Methodist, and all the evangelical churches we see here in America and across the world. A lot of Christians that call themselves Bible Christians came after that era, and it's a signature on their churches. Or in other words, just about any Christian church that is not either Catholic or Eastern Orthodox. But more importantly, this is a good way to show how old a church is. Now, what I'm talking about is we could tell this when they follow Protestant doctrines. I feel like I'm repeating myself a bit much right now, but we cannot go by the name of a church. If a church, whether it's called an apostolic church or the first church of the Nazarene, follows Protestant doctrines, then we would be able to trace its roots back no farther than the past hundred years or so. And there are several churches nowadays who are vying for the top spot of claiming themselves to be the original church of Christ. The original church that Christ founded 2,000 years ago. But in order to tell the age, we would have to look at their signatures, as I've been saying. As an example, the Mormons claim that their church has its roots all the way back to the church that Christ and the apostles founded, and they justify this because they claim the apostolic tradition was lost after the death of the last apostle. And the Mormons believe that apostolic tradition was given back to the Mormon church after Joseph Smith was approached by two angels of God back in the 1800s. I've been told this several times. Now the problem with that claim is that the Mormon church follows Protestant doctrines. And one of those doctrines being the Bible alone doctrine. That means that they follow Protestant tradition, not apostolic tradition. And the reason why I call it Protestant um, tradition is because if we were to look for this doctrine and the basis of this doctrine in the Bible, we wouldn't be able to find it. And that's because it's not there. There is no reference to the Bible alone doctrine. And my point is that if it's not in the Bible, it is tradition. So they're following Protestant tradition, not apostolic tradition. They didn't gain apostolic tradition back in the 1800s because of that. And that's how we could tell. Also, the Mormons read from the King James Version of the Bible I've asked several Mormons about this, and they all confirm. They read from the King James Version of the Bible. And as apologists know, as us Catholic apologists know, the King James Bible wasn't in, published until the year 1610. It was published by the Protestants and for the Protestants. The King James Version of the Bible is yet another signature on the Protestant churches from the 1600s, um, excuse me, the 1500s. So, 
with this in mind, we must conclude that the Mormon Church cannot trace its roots back farther than the 1500s because of its Protestant doctrines. But even more importantly, they can't trace their roots back further than the 1800s by its founder, Joseph Smith. And he was from the state of Vermont, right here in the, uh, in the good old U.S. of A. That's how recent that church was founded. Now, these two facts are excellent examples of these, this idea that I'm trying to um, explain here of signatures. Signatures that tell us a lot about of, uh, a country's roots or even a church's roots. The USA has her roots that come from England because we here speak English. Mexico has roots from Spain because they speak Spanish. The Anglican and the Lutheran churches can trace their roots back to the 1500s, Protestant revolt, and they have their signatures on their churches from that era to prove it. So, let's go back to the issue, the, the main um, issue at hand here, the first problem, or I'm sorry, the issue of call no man on earth father, the first problem I point out with this issue is that it follows, no one follows the rule, call no man on earth father, even though they try to enforce it. I say that because I've met many Christians who remind me to not call any man on earth father, yet in the same breath sometimes, would call George Washington a founding father of the United States. Now, this is one of the big issues that always comes up during a debate and during Protestant preaching as well. Call no man on earth father, but nine times out of ten, the same people who remind us of that would quote the Bible and say, honor thy mother and thy father. They'll also say things like, uh, oh yeah, my father said this, or my father taught me that. If scripture says, call no man on earth father, doesn't that mean no man? Not one? I would suggest that maybe they're taking Matthew 23, 9 out of context. Now, it's in Jesus' own words, Matthew 23, 9, call no man on earth father. Yet in Matthew 19, 19, Jesus quotes from the Ten Commandments, excuse me, and he clearly states, honor thy mother and thy father. Also, we could go on and investigate Paul's letters. And in Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 4, verses 16 and 17, Jesus calls Abraham father of us all. So why would Jesus say these things if he did not want us to call any man on earth father? Does this mean that Jesus was contradicting himself as noted in the Bible? Well, an atheist would most likely say that he is and he would have us believe that he is. But a Bible Christian might disagree with our, with our tradition and on the same breath contradict themselves at the same time. Now I say this because back in Albuquerque, I was part of a political group and many of the members of the group were evangelical Christians. The funny thing is, that I was able to make a positive connection with any one of them right up until the moment when they would find out that I'm Catholic. And from there it would go downhill. One of the issues they would always hit me with was why do Catholics call priest father? And they'd always say things like, don't you read the Bible? And it was always said in an angry tone as well. Then, I would think back a couple of days earlier when we had a conversation, me and the same person, and they would call George Washington a founding father of, the, of our country. I could never understand the difference between calling priest father and using the term founding father when referring to a past military or 
political figure. Now, if you believe in the Bible alone doctrine and follow it to a T, aren't you prohibited from calling any man father? So let's go back to the question. Does that mean that Jesus was contradicting himself in the Bible? And the answer to that question is a conclusive no, because what we're leaving out here, besides tradition, is context. When we read the Gospel, we must keep in mind the fact that the Caesars of the era were claiming to be divine. And the people of Rome were required to call the Caesars Father, as in God the Father, not just Father in the spiritual sense of a spiritual leader, but of a God. So Jesus wasn't saying, call no man on earth Father, literally. He was saying, call no man on earth Father, as in Father the Creator, as in our Father who are, who are in heaven. A divine person whom we should worship as a, as a, a God, as opposed to a, father, a spiritual leader, leader, like a priest. Excuse me. This issue gives us a great example of why we should not build an entire doctrine or belief based on what we read in the Bible. There are many things that we should keep in mind while reading Scripture, and this is another point about the Bible alone doctrine of the 1500 Protestant movement. Well, those are some of the reasons why we need to read and understand the Bible in its proper context. And that I would have to say for anything we read, I actually. And that's all the time we have for tonight. So I'd have to say good night to everyone out there listening to WCATradio.com. Please join us once again for our next show. And we will be talking about misunderstood Catholic doctrines. Um, the next issue we'll talk about is confession. Why we confess our sins to a priest. And I have a two-part series on that one where we give a good Bible-based argument for why we confess our sins to the priest. And the second one will be um, why the doctrine makes sense base that argument on reason. I'm looking forward to spending this time with everyone out there who are listening to, uh, in interested in listening to what I have to say and to hear from you as well. Please email me at Madrigal, which is spelled M-A-D-R-I-G-A-L dot Robert, R-O-B-E-R-T at Ymail dot com. Please feel free to send me any questions or even more importantly, comments. If you have something to say and uh, you feel that I've stated something wrong or incorrect, I'll be the first one to admit it. I would like to ask everyone to pray for fallen Catholics to return to the church so they may take part in confession, which is a very important part of forgiveness. But for now, let's end the show the right way. That would be with a prayer. We'll begin our prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we come to you in thanksgiving this evening for this opportunity to come together as brothers and sisters in Christ for this, so that we may learn more about our faith for the sake of defending the faith. We ask that you grant us the strength to explain and defend our faith with patience and charity and to see challenges to our faith as a chance to evangelize and to spread the love and peace of Christ to all whom we meet. And to do this through the example of self-sacrifice that Christ provides for us through his death on the cross. We ask this in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. We'll end our prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So until our next show, if you could join us, please take care, and may God be with you in everything you do. Goodbye, and God bless. Hello, God's Beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. 
God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes flight.